Hello and welcome to the latest Science of Sport podcast. I'm your host, Matt Solomon, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Lewis Mesquita. So Lewis is the co-founder of The Peak, a sport performance gym in Portugal. He's also a qualified physiotherapist and strength and conditioning coach. And recently I spoke to Lewis about how he uses just one workout to get his athletes into peak condition. And therefore I invited him on the show today to discuss exactly how he can do that and what you can learn from it. So without further ado, it's time to welcome Lewis onto the show. So Lewis, welcome to the Science of Sport podcast again. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Matt, for another invitation to be here again with you. It's always a, pl- a pleasure to chat with you, either oh. in person or online. <laughs> oh, we, we discovered that recently as well. It was, it was an absolute pleasure to spend some time with you. And obviously, this has led to, to one of our conversations uh, whilst we were together, has, has led to this. So something that really interested me whilst we were talking is, is how you use this kind of uh, single modality, one training session, and how that one thing can then lead to, to peak conditioning. So before we get into all of those things, which I'm interested about, for those who don't know who you are, can you give us a quick introduction as to who you are and what you've been up to until now? Yeah, so my name is Luis Mesquita. I'm a Portuguese uh, physiotherapist and SNC coach uh, for the last 11 years. Uh, I've been working in a variety of sports, both individual and team sports, uh, mainly athletics, football, volleyball, roller hockey. Um, and I've been working not only in Portugal as well as in China, um, but recently and more recently, and actually I'm one of the one of the founders and owners of a couple of training facilities here in Portugal called the Peak. So briefly, this is this is it. Perfect. So, what what led you to to this kind of training method? So we're going to get into what what it is in just a second. But how did you come to the point where you're like, I'm just going to do one single session and just use that one thing for a number of of weeks and months? How how did you get there? Yeah, one guy. So back in 2017, I was working for Exos in in Shanghai, in China, and I knew uh, I was working in the same training facility as um, athletics co- coach from the from throwing events in athletics called Derek Ively. And Derek Ively, um is one of the guys that had the privilege and opportunity to work and also live together with Anatoly Bondarchuk, which is a legendary track and field coach. Um, and basically, this was the first time I saw this being applied in real life setting with real with real athletes. And it always intrigued me uh, since the first moment that Derek shared this with me, because it challenges a lot of the thoughts and biases we have, especially in SNC. So SNC professionals normally we have like this kind of uh, philosophy and uh, first principles of training like progressive overload etc and back in 2017 when i saw this being applied uh like an athlete doing the same programs the same training programs with any change without any change and they still improve that started intriguing me and knowing uh, in trying to know more about it and directly has been huge influence on me so this is where it started back in 2017. Fantastic and then what that brings us on to the probably the most important question why would an athlete go to all of that that effort to do exactly the same gym session all of the time without any change? So basically this is not only for the gym this is a, a this is a training set system for, for sports in general. If your sport is in the gym, like powerlifting or weightlifting, that's perfect. We may focus mainly on the weight room. But if your sport is like in athletics, any of the events, sprints, jumps, or, or throws, or any other, for example, team sport, um, this in team sports is a little bit more difficult to, to apply. However, we can learn from it. And basically, we know from from literature and scientific research and from physiology that we need to progressively overload in order to avoid stagnation and to keep improving. So this is, this is what we know. However, um, in anywhere in, 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 in physiology tells you that you need to progressively overload like every week or every session or every month or every year. It, it just tells you that at a certain point, you need to 
to to overload in order to keep adapting so basically uh, a nice sentence uh, to, a nice sentence or a nice quote i think i heard this first from mike tushir is like training is all about repeating something until it stops working and after you need to change to something different so basically this approach which uh, which which enters into especially the the bombard Chuk philosophy of periodization it's taking this to the extreme so basically you repeat the same stimulus you can have one program or two programs or three programs we will talk later about this but uh, basically, in the complex method, which is one of the methods uh, within the Gondarchuk system, you just repeat it until you get into peak condition. So until you stop adapting and after you have to change. So basically, this is something a little bit weird for when we compare with traditional literature, but it's all about physiology. So then how, how does this then differ from other types of periodization? So obviously, n I think normally in a lot of people's periodization, maybe every four, six, eight weeks, they would change the exercises, yeah. maybe change the load and the set rep scheme, and then they go on to the next one again. So how, how does this then differ from, from those traditional, or say traditional, yeah. more used um, set rep schemes? So basically, we have different training methods, let's call it this way. We have like the stage method where we start like general and through time, so high volume normally and lower intensity, so less specific and with time intensity, intensity starts to ramp up and the training starts to become more specific. So this is called stage method, something like the, the linear called linear periodization is something like normally uh, a, a stage method. We also have a block method where training is divided into blocks like physical preparation block and now technical block or uh, uh, physical preparation or maximal strength and strength training and after speed training. This is, uh, this is like similar to the conjugate periodization from Verkoshansky and Vladimir Surin. And we have the complex method uh, where we are training everything together at the same time. Of course, we may have different emphasis in different phases or in different training cycles, but every exercise classification, both general and specific, are trained at the same time. And this is where, for example, Anatoly Bondarchuk, most programs come from a complex method, as well as if we think about history, Charlie Francis' vertical integration is also an example of, of complex method. So basically, the main difference between calendar-based program, where the training cycle or the, the, the training cycles or the training phases are divided, depending on how much time we have to a competition. So if we have, for example, 12 weeks for a competition, we will do, let's focus more on the strength development side. We will have four weeks of maximal strength, four weeks of power development, and four weeks of speed. speed let's call it this way. Uh, while in reaction-based programming, we don't, of course, we need to be in peak condition at the day of the major competition. If it's an individual sport, we have normally more time to prepare it. If it's a team sport, it's like every week or in certain phases of the season. But in reaction-based programming, we don't have fixed time to, to, to complete a training cycle. We just base the planning on the response of the athlete. So basically, we can learn from the response, especially in the complex method, uh, which is easier to do this. Um, we learn from the response of the athlete and a training cycle for an athlete may last 12 weeks, for another athlete may last eight weeks. It depends on their response. But more than time, and we will talk this in a, in a few seconds, but more than time is the, how many exposures the athlete has to reach peak condition. And this is, um, even if you don't do this, it's something that you learn by applying something like this system. So, so to, to kind of summarize that, there's, there's lots of different ways you can do it, 
Uh -huh. But there's kind of a, a few a few main ones. And basically what you're doing then is you're saying, right, we're going to expose the athlete to a number of stimuli, however many that's going to be, to get the adaptation, as opposed to saying, we've got a four-week program, this is what you're going to do. And in four weeks' time, it's going to be three times 12, and we're going to start at three times eight or whatever. So it's kind of a, a more athlete-centered approach as opposed to a, a calendar-centered approach. Yeah, normally, like... Elite coaching always adapt the program to the athlete and not the other way around. But normally calendar-based um, programming, we force athletes into entering into adaptation. While in reaction-based programming, we, we wait for the athlete to adapt to the stimulus and then we change. So that's the main philosophical difference between both. Both work. Most athletes in the world, in history, have been highly successful using calendar-based and all this uh, progressive overload, but it's not the only way. And that's the main thing that we can learn from this. Perfect. So you, you mentioned it just now, right? Obviously, it could take eight weeks, it could take 12 weeks. How many times does an athlete need to repeat the same training session in order to get an adaptation? Yeah, that's the biggest learning we can get from something like this is that normally we, we say that an athlete using like common uh, training plan uh, can reach, can peak like one or two or three times a year. And the reason why people say this is that normally people use a stage method and to get to the end of the stage method, so again, to the strength development, maximal strength, power, speed, peaking, etc. this takes time. And normally the progression takes around 12 to 16 weeks or 24 weeks. It depends on how much time you have. And that's why people say athletes can peak one to, to three times in a, in a year. Uh, but adaptation does not come with time. It comes with the repetition to a certain stimulus. So if you have more different stimulus, you will get, for example, 20 sessions of each program. So let's call a program a single training unit. If you have five training units and you are doing once per week to accumulate, uh, to accumulate, uh, to accumulate 50 sessions, if you do you have five different sessions, but you do once a week, each one of them. To accumulate 50 sessions, it will take you 50 weeks, okay? If you just have one single training session and you repeat that five times a week, to, to accumulate 50 total sessions, it will, it will take you a fifth of the time. It will take you 10 weeks only. And what we learn by doing something like this is that if you increase density, so if you repeat the same stimulus more often, you get into peak condition faster because you accumulate the same total number of sessions in a shorter period. So adaptation does not come with time. It comes with repetition to a same stimulus. And, th and this is individual. However, it takes much longer than we normally think. Like it takes, it takes, uh, Varek uh, talks about 40 to 50 sessions. I did this with, uh, with professional athletes, especially in the jumps, in the, in the jumps events in track and field with one triple jumper. I do this with myself and the total number of sessions must be more than 35 for sure. So normally people, they change stuff faster than it's necessary. I'm not saying that change is bad, but every time we change, we delay the time to peak condition. This is another learning that we can get from doing like this. So every time we change, our body needs time to adapt to the new stimulus. So it takes longer to reach peak condition. If you want to reach peak condition faster and you don't change, you'll get there faster. And this is why if you use just one training unit and you repeat it often during the week, and this is something that, for example, in the shot put or in the discus or in the hammer throw, like Derek works, they do one single session, but they do that eight to 10 times a week. 
So they reach peak condition much faster and they can have seven or eight peaks in a single year. So this is, this is the main uh, difference in all, and it all comes to, to density and frequency of stimulus. So obviously that, that covers some different um, variables that you can use. Like how, how do you use variety within that as well? So looking at the global picture, obviously if everything stays the same all the time, then you have very little variety of that, of that training. So how do you then put variety in to, um, to change then the stimulus? So change variation is key to long-term development. If you don't have variation, if you are doing the same stuff over and over, years after years, you will start losing adaptive, uh, adaptive potential because it's not a new thing for, for your system. Uh, so ver variation is very important over the long term. However, if you use a complex method, the first day you start a training cycle, you just repeat over and over the same sessions and you don't change volume and intensity. And this is what normally SNC coaches have more issues to understand when, like I did in 2017 when I saw this for the first time, it's like we, we are used to week one, 80%. Week two, 82.5 or 85. Week three, 90. And when you use the complex method, you, if you start with 80, you keep 80. So you keep the same load. You keep always the same loads, exercises, number of sets, repetitions. You, you, you just keep everything stable, either on the gym or at your sport. And this is why team sports is difficult because it's a chaotic environment. While in athletics, we can keep things much more stable in team sports such as football or basketball or volleyball or whatever, we cannot do this. However, in the gym, we can keep the stimulus the same. And for example, what we want, if the goal of the gym is to transfer to the track or to the field or to the court, is we want to move the same loads faster and faster. So we keep the same loads and... Session number one will look exactly the same as session number 50. It's the same. It doesn't change. And we just collect data. For example, barbell velocity can be a good metric to, to cover in the, in the weight room. And we wait for the adaptation to happen. And normally, like I said, it takes more than 35 sessions until the point you cannot you, you stop improving. And of course, it's not linear improvement every single session. You will have ups and downs. Some athletes at the beginning, they may even become worse for the first 10, 20 sessions, but after they will come up. If the program is appropriate. Of course, it's, if you are doing something wrong in your program and just repeating it, you cannot expect to improve. But if you do the right things, and don't change, you can also improve. And this is the biggest difference from other, from other models is that in the complex method, nothing changes. And obviously you mentioned then uh, bar velocity is one of the uh, potential metrics to track. Are there any other metrics that people can use then to, to see that they're getting into that peak condition? So the main thing is to analyze the sport first. So we need to collect data and to check if the athlete is in peak condition, the most important variables are the KPIs of the sport. So for example, if you work in athletics and you are in the jumps, is if you are triple jumping, your KPI is triple jumping. So you need to, to, to collect data on of what's happening in triple jumping or in throwing or in sprinting. And if you are working with a team sport athlete, um, we just need to find the physical KPIs that are important for that sport. For example, for football, is important, let's say, short acceleration. It's important change of direction. It's important maximal, speed, uh, maximal sprinting speed. And it's important the rep, uh, repeated sprints with short rest. And maybe for certain positions, also vertical jump high. So these are the things that we should monitor over time during a training cycle. However, when you utilize the complex method where everything is trained together at the same time, things in the weight room also improve at the same rate as the sport KPIs. So you will pick normally everything together, your strength levels, your speed levels, your power levels, 
everything will peak at the same time if you use the complex method. If you use a stage method, you are expecting some things to peak before the others, but if you use the complex, everything will peak at the same time. So for the weight room, uh, barbell velocity is a good metric today to collect barbell velocity. We can do that even if we don't have a linear positional transducer, we can even use our smartphone, smartphones. Um, but normally barbell, barbell velocities have good correlation from the data I have, good correlations with jumping performance, with sprinting performance. So that can be a backup. Now, if, you're, if your sport is powerlifting, then um, barbell velocity is enough. You don't need to track jumping or, or, or sprinting. Just monitor the KPI for your sport. Perfect, perfect. So when you bring all of this together, I'm really interested to hear how this looks in, in a training session. So obviously, uh, it would be great to hear how you can combine then like that stuff in the gym and that, that complex method that you mentioned, because I think that mm -hmm. makes it a little bit more interesting. Um, in that complex method, what does a session look like? Yeah, so I'll give you my personal example, okay, that I'm doing right now, because since to, to, to simplify, just using the gym, so I'm, I'm training at the gym and I'm doing this with myself. I did this, like I said, with, a, with a, an Olympic level triple jumper. Uh, but in the gym, basically, First, we need to select how many programs we want to have. The more programs, so programs is a, uh, a training unit, a single training unit. The more programs you have, the more different programs, you will cover more variety of stimulus. So you can expect that the response over the long term can be larger. But since you have more different programs, it will take longer to reach, for example, 40 sessions of each. So if you have three programs, 40 sessions means 120 total sessions, right? And it will take longer to accumulate 120 sessions. If you have two sessions, like I have right now, so I have an upper, upper body session and a lower body session, where my main goal is to try to jump higher, especially in the two, take, uh, two, two leg uh, to like take off, like two step plus uh, to like take off. Um, if I only have two sessions and I need 40 sessions, the same example as before, instead of 120, now I need 80 sessions. So I reach peak condition faster. So what I'm doing is I have an upper body session and my upper body session is very traditional general strength, mass, maximal strength in weight room where I have, for example, a main lift, such as the pause bench press. And I have other accessory work, like vertical pulling, horizontal pulling, etc. So I have around six to eight exercises in my session, where I keep the loads every single session exactly the same. And the bench press is where I collect barbell velocity. Okay. In the lower body session, I start with jumps because that's the most specific stimulus for the goal i have i do around 20 jumps with two steps approach and four steps approach with two leg takeoff after i do jump squats three sets of jump squats with 40 kilos uh, i do three sets of back squat with three repetitions like 100 kilos 110 120 and I finish off with um, half back squat from the pins. And I do this two sessions, so two programs. I repeat them four times a week, four to five times a week. So each. I have each. So I have eight to 10 total sessions in the week. And if you think about this, like squatting five times a week may look crazy, but it all comes with the dose of each session. Of course, I'm not killing myself on each session. It's a short session. And two things are very important. Volume for each session. And especially in the gym, is important the RPE of each lift. So the repetitions in reserve, you need to leave a lot of repetitions in reserve. Otherwise, you get injured by doing these frequencies. So basically, I'm doing 8 to 10 sessions a week where for you to have an idea in the back squat, like my heaviest load 
is a, a velocity of above 0 0.7 meters per second. So that's around 70, 75% of one of my one RM, but I'm doing five times a week. And when I do this, I keep, as I said, the same stimulus over and over. So right now I am today, after we finish this, I, uh, recording this, we, I will be doing my 20th session of lower body in the last 40 days. So I have, so we are talking every other day, basically training and I track the velocity and according to my training history, it takes me between 50 to 55 sessions of each to reach a peak. And for you to have an idea in the previous cycle, I started, for example, uh, with 100 kilos. I started the training cycle and it took six months, 26 weeks, no deload. And it started as 0 0.6 meters per second. And my peak came at 0 0.99 meters per second. So I improved 0 0.39 meters per second, doing the same session over and over without changing anything. And this is a bit different from what people are used, but it follows the progressive overload, because progressive overload just states you need to progressively overload in order to avoid stagnation. And if you are improving, you still didn't adapt to that stimulus. You just have to change, and then variety and change is so important, is after you start adapting. Because when you reach peak condition, if you keep doing the same, you'll get worse. That's for sure. But until you get there, you can change, no problem. It will just take longer to reach peak condition. So that's number one. And if you don't change, you will reach peak condition fast. Those are the main, those are the main, uh, the main, the, the main things that we can learn by doing something like this kind of complex method. Absolutely fantastic. I really enjoyed that. I think that's super interesting and really, really good to see how you don't have to do the traditional stuff to get really good results. And obviously, yeah, that, that change from uh, 0 0.6 to almost one meter per second in a, in a hundred kilo squat. I think a lot of people would sign for that in six months. So uh, yeah, Matt, maybe it's going to, yep. An important thing is that the traditional works. The main, yeah, yeah, of course. The, main, the main lesson with this is that don't be afraid of experimenting. And a lot of, there are a lot of roads to the same destination. So it's not because someone wrote that we have to do a deload week after three weeks or every four weeks we need to do a deload. It depends. If you are improving, why do you have to change? You can change if you want, but it's not mandatory. And that's the main thing. And if you are collecting and analyzing the response of the athlete, and if they are still improving, you are doing something right. It's just a matter of provide a stimulus, check the response, and adapt the training accordingly. Absolutely fantastic. Lewis, massive thanks for your time and effort today. It's been a pleasure talking. Where can people find out a little bit more about you and uh, what you're up to? Yeah, I'm mostly on, on Instagram. So you can, if you search by my name, Luis Mosquito, you can, you can find me. I also have a, a website, a blog that I started some years ago. It's called Bridging the Gap. So the, the, the link is btgap.org. And I have some things written over there over the last few years. And most recently, I, uh, I'm not writing that often over there, but I have some, some things that might be interesting. And yeah, that's it. Perfect, mate. So thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure talking and I uh, look forward to speaking again soon. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Cheers, buddy. Enjoyed. Cheers. Bye. Bye. And that's it. Once again, a massive thanks to Lewis for all of his hard work on today's podcast. I really appreciate it. I'm sure you do at home too. Before you leave, I want to point you in the direction of the Science of Sport Coach Academy. The Coach Academy is an overgrowing library of sports science courses, which are broken down into bite-sized chunks. And that means you can fit it in and around your busy coaching schedule. What's more, every time you complete one of the courses, you'll get a certificate of completion to prove your ongoing education. So if you're interested, all you have to do is click the link in the show notes and you can get into the Coach Academy completely for free using that link for the next seven days. And in addition, it'd be fantastic if you could recommend us to a coach, a colleague, an athlete, or a friend. That means that we can keep bringing the best possible guests and the best possible content. And that's it. 
Once again, a massive thanks from me and Matt Solomon for Science Support, and I'll speak to you next week.